Turn your Bibles to Psalm 49. Psalm 49. Psalm 49. This is the word of God. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they call lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. And the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Let's come before God again in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we hear your word, you are speaking. These are your very words. So Lord, open our hearts to hear what you have to say. And may you take away all distraction, all temptation from us, that our eyes may be lifted to Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that we would know you more. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, do you trust in money? Money is something in this world that is necessary. It can be very good. It can do great things. It can build amazing things. It can help people. It can provide for people's necessities. But on the other hand, it can also hurt. It can be used against people to get uh, someone's way. It can be used as a form of power, form of control. It can so easily become an idol in itself. 1 Timothy uh, 6 verse 10 tells us money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is tricky. Because it's not a bad thing in itself. When you think of money, money is really, uh, just a, it's really a trade of labor. Money is a currency so that we can, we can trade our work for somebody else's work. That said, money gets things done. When you have lots of money, you can get a lot of things done. Without money, this building wouldn't be here. So money is essential, really, to the functioning of our churches, the way we run them now. You know, I say that qualifying in a way because money is not essential. We would function because God will never let his church cease. So why are we talking about money so much? Well, that way I can get everyone's attention. What's he going to say about money? Well, Psalm 49 is about the foolishness of trusting in wealth, trusting in money. And I dare say we all have struggles with money. We have struggles with wanting more. We have struggles with spending, maybe on things that we shouldn't, maybe with things that we should be spending money on. We all have trouble, troubles with money. And Psalm 49 is a, is a psalm uh, because it, well, it's a, psalm, a good psalm because it points us uh, not to money, not to trust in money, but to trust in Jesus. Psalm 49 points out the foolishness of trusting in money. Why? Because we die. And money means nothing in the grave. Verse 7 says, No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. 
that he should live on forever and not see the pit. You want to live forever? Well, there's no amount of money so you can get that. There's no place on earth that you can go. The fountain of youth down in Florida, you can't go anywhere to find that, to live on forever. So let's look at this idea of trusting in Jesus and not in money, as we find it in Psalm 49. I titled this sermon, The Riddle. I borrowed that from a commentator. Psalm 49 lays it out like this as a riddle. So first, we're going to look at, we're going to have four points. First, we'll look at uh, the riddle introduced in the first four verses. Then we're going to have the riddle explained in verses 5 to 13. And then third, we'll have the riddle solved. That's right in the middle, verse 14 and 15. And then finally, we'll have the riddle applied in verse 16 to 20. So riddle introduced, explained, solved, and applied. So whenever you have a riddle, first we're going to look at a riddle introduced. Whenever you have a riddle, if you were just to walk up to somebody and say a riddle to them, uh, they would be looking at you as kind of uh, like you're crazy. <laughs> what are you thinking? Because without an introduction to a riddle, you sound crazy. So David here, or so, so the sons of Korah, sorry, not, not a, a Davidic psalm. The sons of Korah have an introduction here at the beginning. They say, hear this, all you peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from the heart will give understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp, I will expound my riddle. So there's three things in that, in that introduction that we have there. First, uh, the psalmist says uh, who he's speaking to. Secondly, he tells uh, what type of psalm this is. And then third, uh, he tells us how he, will, how he will speak this psalm, how he will speak what he's speaking to us. So first, uh, attention is, is called for who he is uh, speaking to, who is hearing this. And the point that he's saying is everybody is hearing this. This is a psalm written by the sons of Korah from the tribe of Judah. They are from, from the, the people of Israel. This would be like, uh, an, an author from North Carolina writing a, a saying and saying, listen to what I say, all North Carolinians. Listen to me, all, all of you even in the States, United States. Listen to me, all of you in the world, everybody, listen to me, every last person. Psalm, Psalm uh, 42 through 49 are all sons of Korah. They're all songs written by the sons of Korah. And they, they build up in spectrum for who they are reaching. Until we reach here. They're for everybody. They're writing this psalm for all to hear. The psalm is for the entire world. If all who live in the world isn't uh, specific enough, as it says, it says rich and poor, high and low. That would be uh, including the middle class as well. Everybody. Everybody in between. It's for everybody. This message isn't just for you and I. It's for uh, the houses beside us. The people at the dollar store that we see, at the grocery store that we see, people that we work with, the people on the other side of the world that you've never met. It's for everybody, everyone. So secondly, what type of, of psalm is this? We see this as a wisdom psalm. It's a psalm to give us understanding. My mouth will speak words of wisdom, it says. It'd be like telling your child, uh, look, son or daughter. You sit them down. I have something very important to tell you, something very serious for you to understand. This knowledge is, is going to affect you for the rest of your life if you use it wisely, and you should use it wisely. It's very important that you understand this. That's what this psalmist is doing, saying this is a psalm of wisdom. I want you to understand what I'm saying here. It's very important. Life will go well with this understanding. So what is this message? Like I said, money doesn't answer all your problems. Jesus does. Money cannot stop you from dying. Only Jesus can. That's the wisdom that he's imparting. But third thing to note from this introduction is to note uh, how he's telling this wisdom. He says this, with the harp, I will expound my riddle. Now, songs affect us. Sometimes we can be going through something and we can hear a song and those words just ring true for us. The rhythm, the music and the rhythm uh, bring home that meaning. So maybe instead of uh, sitting your child, your son or your daughter down and saying, I have something really important to tell you, you could sit them down and compose a song and sing it to them. I guarantee my kids would remember that. Maybe not for what I'm saying, but how I'm singing. But there is something true to that. We understand things. They mean something more to us in song. 
in rhythm. Songs, the Psalms are songs for a reason, written for us to remember uh, gospel truths, written for us to remember what God has done, how he has worked in the past. When we sing in the service, we are singing these truths of what Christ has done. Something simple, but God made us and he knows us. He made us to love music. He made us to be affected by music, by song. So these psalm, this psalm is introduced as uh, for everybody, for all to hear. It's introduced as a wisdom for us to understand, to, to grow in understanding. And it's written in song for us to remember. So we move on uh, to the second point here, uh, riddle explained. And if I were to summarize it, what the riddle is saying, if I were to summarize the explanation, I really take away from the last point because, well, it's written in a song, right? To sing for us to remember. But summarizing things can be helpful along with, with singing them. So a summary of this riddle could be in verse 5. Why should I fear when evil days come, when deceivers surround me? Why should I fear, verse 10, for all can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. The riddle is we care about wealth. We care about comfort so much, yet we die. Why do we care about wealth then? It's very simple and yet very true. <laughs> and I speak from experience. I want nice things. I want to be able to give my wife, my kids things. I want to, to have more time. I want time to go where I'd like. Really, it boils down to we want comfort. We want ease. And money can do all these things. If we have money, we can have more time. We can have more things, possessions. But why do we care about all this? Why do I care about all this? Why do you care about all this? The riddle is that we, we care about earthly pleasures when they don't matter. We can't take anything into the afterlife with us. And you are going to die. I am going to die. Verse 12, but man, despite his riches, does not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. Do you really, really care that you have designer clothes, that you have a new vehicle? Yes, I do care. Do you really care that what everybody thinks about you? Being popular. Why are these things important when we're going to die? And none of that will matter. Even when we die, no one is going to remember us. 40, 50, 60 years, we're going to be forgotten. All the things that we amount, that we have, when we go into the grave, are going to be gone. And our corpse will be left rotting away. The psalmist says, the ransom for your life is costly. No payment is ever enough. Not even Elon Musk could pay for eternal life. Why is it we cling to money? It's something we don't understand. It's a riddle. Luke 12 reminds us of this riddle. Explains it, really, through a story. Luke 12, verse 13 Someone in the crowd said to, to him, to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, uh, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and there will be a, and then I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for you for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, those will, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So this man, this rich man in the parable, had plenty. His crops produced plentifully. So he built a barn and stored all of his crops up. 
and he figured he'd be cared for for years to come. He could live in ease, in riches, in pleasure, be provided for, and yet God says, you can take your life away just like the blink of an eye. And the rich man was taken immediately. And his wealth didn't do anything. Didn't go with him into the grave, but just went into somebody else's until they died. So what is the fault in all this? It's described in verse 13. It says, this is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. Turning to money is trusting in yourself. If you can provide everything you need, you often don't look elsewhere. If there's food on your table, you don't look for food. If there's no food on your table, you have to look for food. I was talking to an uncle of mine uh, back in Canada when I was there, and he's a fairly well-off guy. His sons are have big construction companies, and, and uh, he's doing well. And yet, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He went through surgeries and treatments to really to no avail. It came down to the last straw. He had to have this last surgery. And this last surgery, the percentage of him surviving was 5%. 5% chance that he would live. 95% chance that he would die. 100% chance he would die if he did not have anything done. When you come to that point, money really doesn't matter. You can't depend on yourself. And that was what he, that was what he said. Merely just forced to look to God. What do I do? No other place to go. He cannot trust in horses or chariots or bank accounts or Medicare. He had to trust in these doctors and nurses working on him, which he had to trust in God to provide for him, to guide their hands. Can you say that you trust in God, that you are not trusting in how you've planned your life out and how you've surrounded yourself with firewalls? Is this true in your life? And I have to confess, I can speak this from experience, that I struggle with this. I want comfort. I want ease. I want to sit and not worry about anything, about tomorrow. I'd love to sit and have my feet up and not worry about the next months. Does money control you? And it can control you in different ways. It doesn't have to be that, that you're wanting more. It can be that you spend uncontrollably can also mean that you, that you don't spend it all. You just hoard it and protect it and store it up. But it can also mean that money just consumes all of your thoughts. Everything that you, you do is calculated. Everything that everybody else does is calculated, oriented around cost. How do we escape this? Because it's necessary to think about spending. It is necessary to think about money. But it's not necessary that money controls and dominates you. So the riddle is there. We care about money, and we care about it too much. How do we not care about it too much, and how do we not let it control us? And this takes us to the middle of the psalm, in verse 14 and 15. You'll notice it has that word selah there twice, the end of verse 13 and the end of verse 15. We don't know exactly what that word means. It, it could mean uh, wait. It could mean think about this. It could mean repeat this. But we know uh, there are markers. In this case, it distinguishes the center of the psalm, uh, the focal point of the psalm. Psalm verse 14 and 15 tell us the solution to this riddle. Verse 13 told us that people that trusted in themselves died. Verse 13 said, like sheep, they are destined for the grave and, the, and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave far from princely mansions, but God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. The psalmist makes an astounding statement. He seems to think uh, that he's actually different from everybody else. Everybody else is destined for death. And remember, this psalm is written for all people, rich, poor, low, high, for everybody. And he basically says, you are all going to die and rot in the grave. All your wealth is going to be meaningless and pointless while your body slowly decays and disintegrates into nothing. But, on the other hand, me, he boasts, I'm different, he's saying. He says, God will redeem my life from the grave. 
God's going to redeem his life from the grave. Redeem is to buy back. God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. He thinks he's something special that he's not going to die. Well, he's going to die, but he's going to be redeemed. You know what the redeem word means? To buy back? Say if one of you kids was kidnapped. And the kidnappers wanted $5 million. Maybe some of you kids more, more than $5 million. But say the kidnapper wants $5 million. Well, if your parents loved you a lot, they would give the kidnapper $5 million. If their police couldn't do a bunch of stuff. But your parents would give the kidnappers $5 million and buy you back. So that you'd be given back to your parents. You'd be taken out of the kidnapper's hands. You'd be redeemed. So this psalmist is claiming that someone has, has paid a price to buy him from the grave. And he said in verse 7, no man can redeem the life of another. But he says at the end of verse 15 that God will surely take me to himself. The solution to this riddle is that this life is not all there is. We are going to be bought. We're going to be redeemed from the grave. We are going to be taken to God. The psalm is written for everybody. We're all going to die. The psalmist is saying, you're all going to die, except for me, except for us, the church. We have something to look forward to. The psalm is pointing us to nobody else other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Paul says is, is alive. Paul says, for I deliver to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then to one untimely born, Paul says, to me. This gives us perspective to see all that is going on around us with money, with wealth, with comfort, with His world. Paul continues to say in, in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, he's saying, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, pointless, useless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So this psalmist in Psalm 49 is saying, we're all going to die. We're all going to go into the grave. And Paul says, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we are all dead. We're all going to die. And there's no hope. It's futile. But, he says, if Christ, but if we are in Christ, we have hope in this life. If we are in Christ, we have hope. The solution to this riddle is that death is not the end. So we move on to this riddle applied. John Calvin used an analogy to describe how we understand God. He said we, we needed the spectacles, the glasses of Scripture to know God. For glasses, you look through glasses so you can see something clear, right? Well, we need Scripture, to look through Scripture so we can know God, so we can see Him. So to know God, to know who God is, you'd have to put on glasses, put on Scripture, and to know Him. Well, we could say the same thing about life for us. Without spectacles of Scripture, we cannot understand life. That's why God gave us wisdom psalms, to understand life. It is God sitting us down and saying, Look, Pastor Scotty, this is really important. This is really important for the rest of your life. It's really important for the rest of everybody's life. Jesus has risen from the dead, and this means you will rise from the dead. Brothers and sisters, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will rise from the dead. Death is not the end in this world if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Verse 16 to 20, lay this, lay this out again of, of how we die. Do not be overawed when a man grows rich when splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him Though while he lived, he counted himself blessed, and men praised you when you were prosperous. He will join the generation of his fathers, who will never see the light of life. 
When we look at the world through uh, these glasses, through Scripture, we turn from envy of people with lots of money to pity for people without Jesus. When they die, they have nothing but the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. It's hard to see people having lots, wealth, going on warm vacations and big successful businesses and, and lots of time off, go wherever they please and homes in amazing places. When all those things we care about and yet, what do we think about people's souls? They can have all the most amazing things. They can go on all these amazing vacations. But what do they believe? Where is their soul? Do you care where people are going to go when they die? Or do you care what they have in their garage, in their possession? Psalm 49 says that we do not have to be uh, afraid of wealthy people. Because wealth can do that, can make people powerful in this world. Yes, maybe they have sway in courts. They can hire uh, fancy lawyers. Maybe they have sway in communities. They can sway HOA communities and stuff like that. They can buy and throw money around. They can have influence in government, but they do not have influence with Jesus. Jesus cannot be bought out with money, with gold or with silver, or with anything, anything that this world can offer. Verse 14 says, The upright will rule over those who trust in themselves. Jesus cares about righteousness. Wealth often brings confidence. And when we put our confidence in the world, in the things that we have here, in the comfort that we have here, we are not putting our confidence in Christ. And God cares about the righteous. He cares about how we live our lives. And putting our dependence on Christ is how we deliver our lives, how we are to live our lives. Depending upon Him, leaning upon Him, because we are sinners. We need a Savior. The problem with money can be, not always, it can be that we, we put our trust in other things, we put our confidence in other things. If you're a millionaire, you can go to an auction and yeah, you can throw money. I'll bid on that, I'll bid on that, right? If you don't have the money, you go to an auction, I'll bid on that, I don't have, right? Wealth can bring power. And we can fear that maybe. But in the end, righteousness matters. Not power, righteousness matters. Are we humble before God, realizing our, we are sinners, that our sin deserves death? And the psalm says, the upright will rule because God cares about the upright, cares about the righteous. And this is because of Jesus that the upright will rule. When Jesus redeems us, he redeems us with his blood. We are, we are sprinkled with his blood. Just as the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was sprinkled with blood, showing that something had to die to make God's people holy. We are sprinkled with Jesus' blood, showing that we are covered in His righteousness. That His righteousness has become our righteousness. So we can be jealous of wealthy. We can maybe be uh, jealousy, jealous of even wealthy people in the church. It seems like they have everything. They have Christ and they have wealth. The wealth, comfort, and these, and they have Jesus. And it can be hard to love and to be joyful with others. And yet Jesus' life was for you, was for I. And he gives us hearts to be joyful for others and to love others. And getting a right perspective on the world helps with that. Realizing that this world is not all there is. God gives some of us some things and gives some of us something else. Psalm 49 is a riddle. And the riddle is that wealth makes us long for things in this world. Why do we long for things in this world when we're going to die and we can't take it with us? And the solution is that this world isn't all there is. We look to a God to redeem us, ransoming us from death, taking us out of death. 
And he's done this through Jesus Christ. So this week, turn your eyes from the world, from large cushy bank accounts, from comfort, from ease, turn from popularity, from power. Money can give us all these things. Money can make us fear people that have, or yeah, we can fear people with money because they have power. And yet, when we get perspective and realize it doesn't matter, wealth does not matter. We never have to fear wealth. A believer never has to fear wealth. We don't have to get caught up in bank accounts and large houses and comfort and ease and popularity and power because we look to the resurrection, to heaven. People of God, turn your eyes to heaven this week and know the right way to look at this world. Here and now is not all that there is. We lift our eyes to eternity, to heaven, where Christ brings us, where he's ransomed us so that we can be with him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray again. Lord God and Heavenly Father, again, we come before you in prayer, and it is an amazing thing that we can talk to you. And we can talk to you because you have taken our sin away, and you have given us your righteousness. So when we come before you, we are perfectly holy and righteous. When you see us, you see clean, holy people. And Lord, that is only possible because of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we look at this world and as we struggle with this world because we are still in these fleshly bodies, we struggle with sin, with temptation. We struggle with wanting things. We want comfort. We want ease. We want possessions. And yet, Lord, we have all the possessions that we need in you, in Jesus Christ, because we are going to possess mansions in heaven with you. And Lord, we just get a gaze upon you in eternity. And there can be nothing better than that. Nothing. So Lord, may you lift our eyes from this world to you. May you empower us to live in this world with confidence and with boldness because we have something that everybody, everybody in this world needs. We have Jesus Christ and him risen from the dead. So Lord, make us confident in him and not in what we possess. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our somber response is...